We have been studying the book of Acts for two years now, but we're just two chapters into the book. And last week I began a review of what we've studied so far in order to bring everyone up to speed, to try to restore a sense of momentum. And what I affirmed last week was that the incarnation, earthly ministry, death, burial, resurrection, and ascension of Christ stands not at the end of time, but at the beginning of this chapter in the middle of time. And of this I'm persuaded because when the Word became flesh, the Word remained flesh. When Christ rose from the dead, He rose in His physical body, his body was changed because it had been glorified, but it was still his body. And he ascended into heaven in that same body. He did not leave it behind. And he did not hang it in a closet somewhere in heaven when he got there. And there's a reason for that, and the reason is very simple. His body, his physical body, the body of the incarnation was never a costume. It was never a guise, and it was certainly never a disguise. The Word became flesh. And that was never a symbolic reality. It was and is a bona fide reality, a reality that the Lord spent 33 some odd years living out here on earth and has now spent 2,000 some odd years living out in heaven but in the fullness of time, that 2,000 years is barely a blip on the radar screen. God the Son has a reason for being, to generate glory for God the Father. And in His truly infinite wisdom, He deployed the best tool that His mind could conceive to get the job done. Which tool is the cosmos? this physical universe, which caused most churned out glory by the Yato Watt for some 10 billion years before its turbocharger was installed, which charger is the earth. And when the sun and moon and stars were set in place governing the earth, the cosmos began producing glory by the Bronto Watt. Then, a hundred thousand years ago or so, with the advent of humankind, the cosmos became a finely tuned machine, and it began pumping out glory by the sapienso watt. And God the Father found this to be good, very good. In fact, God so loved the cosmos that he gave his only begotten Son which Son became a permanent fixture in the cosmos, as we read in John 3.19, and this is the judgment. The light has come into the cosmos. And as we read in John 3.21, but whoever does the truth comes into the light, that their works might be made manifest, having been wrought in God himself. Christ became a constituent of the cosmos that through us the cosmos may become may come to abide in Christ even as he abides in it. Or as Paul puts it in 2 Corinthians 1.20, For all the promises of God in him are yea, and in him amen, unto the glory of God by us. And according to Luke, in Acts 1.1, this massive undertaking is just getting underway because all of that is all that Jesus began to do and to teach. Yes, we are in the end times, but in my humble opinion, the latter days ought to be similar in length to the former days. And as such... This is no time for the church to take a knee and run out the clock. No, we're just getting started. And there's a lot of work yet to be done. And that pretty much covers Acts 1.1. In Acts 1, 2 through 3, we find 
that after having spent three days and three nights in the grave, Jesus rose from the dead and appeared to his followers a number of times over the course of the next 40 days. Now, not in this series, but in the Life of Christ series, I went into each of those appearances in great detail. What we uncovered in the scriptures about this phenomenon is that over the course of that 40 days, the Lord spent the great majority of his time with the apostles. He appeared to them no fewer than 12 times. The first of those appearances was quite, was quite brief, lasting only a few minutes. But by the time of the fourth appearance, he was staying with the apostles for hours on end. And in his final appearance, he lived with the apostles for a lengthy period of time, staying with them for what appears to be perhaps even two or three weeks before the day of his ascension. And this, I think, further demonstrates God the, God the Son's solidarity with the cosmos, his solidarity with what has been created. He ascended on the 43rd day after Passover, and then seven days later, he sent the promise. Now, Acts 1, 4 through 8 is predictive of the coming of the promise on the day of Pentecost, and I did not go into these in very much depth until we got to the day of Pentecost in the text. Rather, I turned my attention to the ascension itself, and I asked, where did Jesus go when he ascended? Where is heaven? I mean, God is someone who is somewhere. He is our Father, which art in heaven. We have that from the mouth of Christ himself, and that has to mean something. But it can't mean much if there isn't a place, an actual place somewhere called heaven. At least that is if heaven is a place where anything happens. Work is defined as force times distance. That's a constant that we know is true in this realm, in the cosmos, in the created order. And to the degree that the properties of the heavenly dimension correspond to the properties of this dimension, it appears that the same principle, or one very much like it, applies there as well. Heaven cannot be a state of mind, as some suggest or a state of eternal bliss. Jesus, in the Lord's Prayer, is not suggesting that we pray to our Father, which art upright, downright, inright, outright, happy all the time. No. In John 14, 2 through 3, Jesus says, In my Father's house there are many dwelling places. If it were not so, would I have told you that I go to prepare a place? For you? And if I go to prepare a place for you, I'll come again and take you to myself, that where I am, there you may be also. And the language in this passage is unmistakably locational. As Jesus understands the matter, heaven is a place. Which place is some place? But where? Well, for ages, people read the Bible and quite sensibly concluded from what it says that heaven is somewhere above the sky, somewhere at a high elevation. After all, there are nine passages in the Bible which speak of heaven above, and six of those passages also make reference to the earth beneath. Not only that, but in Genesis 1, 6 through 8, we're told, And God said, Let there be a firmament in the midst of the waters, and let it divide the waters from the waters. And God made the firmament, and divided the waters which were under the firmament from the waters which were above the firmament. And it was so. And God called the firmament heaven, and the evening and the morning were the second day. And from this passage... Uh, and, and others like it, people quite naturally deduced that heaven is up somewhere beyond the azure blue, somewhere above the sky. Now that, as it turns out, wasn't right, at least not in the sense that you can find heaven by flying into outer space. But we've known that for a long time because astronomers have been studying the sky for millennia 
And even though the telescope wasn't invented until about 1600, magnifying glasses have been around since at least the 5th century BC, and the ancients invented such tools as the mural sextant, and the astrolabe, and the cosmolabe, and the planisphere. And they knew what could be visibly seen in near outer space. And among those things, there was nothing like what one would readily identify as heaven. So, what is it that's in view in Genesis 1, 6 through 8? Well, part of the problem with sorting out uh, that, pro that question has to do with the fact that both in Hebrew and in Greek, the word for the dwelling place of God is the same as the word for sky. So, one has to rely on the context to discern whether what's in view with the word heaven is referring to something natural or something supernatural. And it's my considered opinion, based on what we know about Earth history, that what's in view in Genesis 1, 6 through 8 is something natural. Because if you take the passage literally, what we find is that at some point in the formation of this planet, in a time frame that is coincident with the appearance of humankind on the Earth, God introduced a heavenly firmament into the design to separate the waters above from the waters below. Well, the waters below in this scenario are easy to identify because the oceans rest on the planet's surface. And the heavens, that is the sky, the atmosphere, rests above the water on the surface. But what about the waters above? What could that be? Well, if at any time in Earth history there came by some means to be water above the atmosphere, where would it be? Well, in outer space, in low Earth orbit. But outer space is very cold, so any water residing there would be in liquid form. Or, excuse me, it wouldn't be in liquid form, it would be in solid form, which is to say it would be frozen, it would be ice. Now we know that there are four planets in the solar system where that very condition exists. Jupiter, Saturn, Uranus, and Neptune. All four of these planets have water in low planetary orbit, water in the form of ice, which orbits those planets in the form of rings. That's what planetary rings are. And of the planets whose rings have been we've been able to study, 100% of them are comprised largely of crystals of, uh, of water ice. Or to put it another way, beyond the atmosphere of those planets, there are firmaments of water above. And this leads us to the obvious question, was there ever a time when the Earth had rings? And it turns out the answer is yes. According to NASA astronomer Dr. Joe A. O'Keefe, the Earth, in fact, had rings in the past, and this has been corroborated by Peter J. Fawcett of the University of New Mexico and Mark B. E. Boslow of the U.S. Department of Energy's Sandia National Laboratories, who, pub who published a paper in 2002 demonstrating that the Earth has had rings in the past. Their theory is that the rings were formed by debris ejected into outer space when the Earth was struck by a large meteor. Now, in their model, the meteor strike impacted the Earth on land and cast-off material was comprised of dust and rocks. But if the meteor in question struck the ocean, which is much more likely, the Earth being two-thirds ocean, then the cast-off debris would consist largely of water which water would immediately freeze and over time would, co <clears throat> would coalesce into a ring. <clears throat> now, according to Fawcett and Boslow, owing to our proximity to the sun <clears throat> and the Earth's comparatively small size, any such ring system would be short-lived, lasting only about 100,000 years before it gave in to gravitational forces. However, for as long as it remained in orbit, it would be visible from the Earth, and from the ground it would appear to be a solid surface. 
not unlike a firmament in the heavens. And while it was present, it would have had a direct effect on the amount of sunlight reaching the surface of the earth, contributing to the cooling effect that always follows such a meteor impact. And as such, they have concluded that the timing of this phenomenon should coincide with one of the many ice ages the earth has experienced. Moreover, according to these researchers, once the planet began to warm again, the orbit of this ice would begin to decay and it would have a cascading effect on the rest of the ring system which would collapse, falling back to the earth in a very short period of time. Now, there's more to their study than that. I am cherry-picking the data that I'm giving you for the sake of time, but recontextualizing data doesn't falsify it. Repurposing data, provided it does not get distorted in the process, is recycling at its finest. And according to the data in this study, there was a time in Earth history when the Earth's atmosphere served as a firmament, separating the waters below from the waters above. The waters above were frozen into ice crystals, but as that ice age came to an end, the earth warmed, and the waters above began to thaw and fell back to earth in a very short period of time. Well, the most recent ice age began about 100,000 years ago, a time which corresponds roughly to the appearance of humankind on earth and it ended about 12,000 years ago. And shortly thereafter, the Bible tells us in Genesis 7, 11 through 12, the windows of heaven were opened, and rain fell upon the earth 40 days and 40 nights. Now from that launching point, I could go much deeper into creation science and scientific inquiry into the first 11 chapters of Genesis, but I'd quickly get in over my head, and I'm not prepared to wade too deeply into the waters below, where the nut jobs swim. <laughs> I may do a series on this sort of thing someday, but not without considerably more research. And I don't want to derail this series. My purpose in bringing this up today is simply to demonstrate why I am persuaded that the firmament of heaven mentioned in Genesis 1 refers not to the supernatural abode of God, but to a divinely superintended natural occurrence that, while foreign to us, is not foreign to the natural order. In Romans 1, Paul assured, he assures us that God reveals himself reliably through what has been created. And as such, good scientific inquiry, properly conducted and properly interpreted, ought always to corroborate good biblical inquiry, properly conducted and properly interpreted. And while there's no compelling evidence to suggest that what's in view in Genesis 1, 6-8 is the dwelling place of God, there's at least some scientific evidence to, that indicates that what's in view in that passage is an unadorned, plain description of the actual state of things in the upper atmosphere of this planet during that period of Earth history. So, if Genesis 1, 6-8 doesn't tell us where heaven is, is there a passage in the Bible that does? Is this a question that has a biblical answer? Well, yes, I think it does. Indeed, the Bible tells us quite a lot about this question. First, we have the testimonial evidence in Scripture that affirms that heaven is in fact a place, the properties of which place correspond in significant ways to the properties of this place, of this cosmos, of this dimension. <clears throat> in Daniel 10, we find Daniel at prayer. And he's been at prayer for three weeks without a reply. But then, starting in verse 12 of Daniel 10, the reply comes, and it is delivered personally by the archangel Gabriel. Then he said to me, Fear not, Daniel, for from the first day that you set your heart to understand and humbled yourself before God, your words have been heard, and I have come because of your words. The prince of the kingdom of Persia withstood me twenty-one days, but Michael, one of the chief princes, came to help me, 
for I was being detained there with the king of Persia. But now I have come to make you understand what will happen to your people in the latter days. For the vision refers to many days yet to come. Now in this passage, we get rare and valuable insight into the heavenly realm. And the picture it reveals is of a place with the same four dimensions as the earthly realm. Height, width, depth, and time. Because what Gabriel tells Daniel reveals that the heavenly realm is dimensional in a sense that corresponds almost directly uh, with the sense uh, uh, of the, the realm that we occupy. Daniel has been praying for 21 days and Gabriel comes to him and says, from the first day you began speaking, your prayer has been heard. Well, this indicates that Gabriel, as he went about his business in the spiritual realm, was aware of time and of the passage of time. And according to what Gabriel says next, it sounds very much like he is experiencing the passage of time very much in the same way that Daniel is experiencing it. Because Gabriel reports that the prince of the, uh, the, prince of the kingdom of Persia withstood him 21 days. Well, if the spiritual realm isn't dimensional, what is 21 days to Gabriel? Why should he even be aware of the passage of time while he's fighting with the prince of Persia if the spiritual realm is completely free from the strictures of time and space then Daniel shouldn't have had to have waited at all for his answer because no time should have been, should have been passing while whatever was happening in the spirit world was happening. That is, if time is merely a construct if time is an artificial template placed over the expanse of eternity for our benefit to accommodate for our limited capacity to grasp reality, and if, as so many insist, the spiritual realm is not subject to time. But, beloved, think about it. Because unless we assume either that Gabriel is deluded or that as a co-conspirator with God in the ledger domain of time, he's deliberately feeding Daniel misinformation, then we should probably take him at his word. In Daniel 10. And according to his report, he experienced the passage of those 21 days very much the same way that Daniel did, in real time. Not only that, but Gabriel goes on to say that the prince of the kingdom of Persia withstood him 21 days, but Michael, one of the chief princes, came to help him, for he was being detained there with the king of Persia. The reason that Gabriel's answer to Daniel's prayer was delayed, according to the archangel, was because Gabriel was occupied for those 21 days. And he wasn't occupied just for a period of time. He was occupied in a particular place. Daniel was somewhere. And Gabriel was somewhere else. Well, where? Well, we don't know exactly, but we do know that wherever it was, the prince of Persia was there too. Now, most people understand this prince of Persia to be some demonic spirit an angel of Satan who is in some sense controlling the earthly ruler of Persia. And I think that's probably right. And what Gabriel tells us about this prince of Persia is that he is somewhere, and that wherever that somewhere is, Gabriel had to be there to engage him. He couldn't do it from where Daniel was. He could not do battle with the prince of Persia unless he was where the prince of Persia was. As a matter of fact, he had to wait in that location until Michael came to his relief because Michael was also somewhere, somewhere other than where Gabriel and the Prince of Persia were. And Michael had to depart from wherever he was in order to go to wherever Gabriel was so that Gabriel could leave that location and go to where Daniel was. And that tag team effort took 21 days to accomplish. 
Now, beloved, I don't know how anybody can read that and conclude that the heavenly realm has no extension in time or space. Or that things that are supernatural must, by necessity, be supradimensional, being devoid of temporal possibilities or locational possibilities. No, if Gabriel's report to Daniel in Daniel 10 is accurate, then it can only be that the heavenly realm, while not corporeal, has a physicality of some kind, a physicality all its own, which physicality corresponds at multiple points with the physicality of the realm that we occupy. And this is supported by Paul's testimony in 2 Corinthians 1, uh, 12, 2 through 4, where he says, I know a man in Christ who 14 years ago was caught up to the third heaven. Whether in the body or out of the body, I do not know. God knows. And I know that this man was caught up into paradise. Whether in the body or out of the body, I do not know. God knows. And he heard things that cannot be told, which man may not utter. Now, when this is read in its full context, it becomes clear that the man Paul is speaking of here is, in fact, himself. Paul was caught up to the third heaven and there had an experience, much of which he has been forbidden by the Lord from revealing. However, what he does reveal about that, that experience sheds a degree of light on the question at hand in today's lesson. Because while he is unable to say for certain whether he was there in body or in spirit only, he reports that his experience of heaven was of a place that could have accommodated his body. Which is to say that clearly when Paul was caught up into the third heaven, he had a 3D experience. An experience of a tangible environment which was sufficiently tactile to have been compatible with his physical experience. So, we know that heaven, though supernatural, is not supra-dimensional. It is every bit as tactile, every bit as concrete, every bit as substantive, every bit as material as the earthly realm. And it's directly accessible from the earthly realm from multiple points, suggesting that its physicality corresponds with the physicality of this dimension both materially and spatially, because it's not only conversant with this dimension, it's accessible to this dimension both on multiple planes and at multiple points. And to the best of my knowledge, the clearest indicator of this in Scripture is to be found in Daniel 5. There, starting in verse 2, we find the following. Belshazzar, when he tasted the wine, commanded that the vessels of gold and of silver that Nebuchadnezzar, his father, had taken out of the temple in Jerusalem be brought, that the king and his lords, his wives, and his concubines might drink from them. Then they brought in the golden vessels that had been taken out of the temple, the house of God in Jerusalem, and the king and his lords, his wives, and his concubines drank from them. They drank wine and praised the gods of gold and silver, bronze, iron, wood, and stone. Immediately, the fingers of a human hand appeared and wrote on the plaster of the wall of the king's palace opposite the lampstand. And the king saw the hand as it wrote. Then the king's color changed. His mind began to race. The joints of his loins were loosened and his knees knocked together. Well, Belshazzar was keen to figure out what exactly had just happened and what it meant. So he sent for Daniel, who explained to him at some length why this had happened and what it meant. Picking up in verse 22, And you, his son Belshazzar, have not humbled your heart through, uh, excuse me, though you knew all this. But you have lifted up yourself against the Lord of heaven, and the vessels of his house have been brought in before you, and you and your lords, your wives, and your concubines have drunk wine from them, 
and you have praised the gods of silver and gold, of bronze, iron, wood, and stone, which do not see or hear or know, but the God in whose hand is your breath, and whose are all your ways, you have not honored. And it was from his presence that the hand was sent, and that this writing was inscribed. And this is the writing that was inscribed, Mene, Mene, Tekel, and Parson. And this is the interpretation of the matter. God has numbered the days of your kingdom and brought it to an end. You have been weighed on the scales and found wanting. Your kingdom is divided and given to the Medes and the Persians. So Belshazzar is having a party when all of a sudden a hand appears out of the thin air and writes on the wall, Mene, Mene, Tekel, Parson. And according to Daniel, that hand proceeded from the presence of God. Well, where's the presence of God? Well, according to Jesus, God is our Father, which art in heaven. So what does that tell us? Well, it tells us that heaven is at hand, and in a somewhat literal sense. In Matthew 4, 17, we read that, From that time Jesus began to preach and to say, Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Now, we hear that, and we assume that what he meant by that is that the time of the inauguration of the kingdom is approaching. Get ready for the time is drawing nigh. And if indeed, and indeed, if that's what he meant, he was right, the time was drawing nigh. And even to this day, the time for the consummation of the kingdom is still drawing nigh. But what if by my hand, Jesus wasn't referring to a reference in time, but to a reference in space? What if at hand, here, doesn't mean presently, but present. What if at hand in this context doesn't mean penultimate, but propinquitous? What if when Jesus says that the kingdom of heaven is at hand, what he means by that is that the kingdom of heaven is to hand? That would certainly be consistent with the dictionary definition of a gitso, the Greek word that's translated at hand here. It would also be consistent with the way that the word agitso is used in the Septuagint. That's the way the word is used in Exodus 19.22. And let the priests who come near to the Lord consecrate themselves, lest the Lord break out against them. And again in Genesis 48.10, Now the eyes of Israel were dim with age, so that he could not see. So Joseph brought them near him. And he kissed them and embraced them. And again in Exodus thirty-four thirty, Aaron and all the people of Israel saw Moses, and behold, the skin of his face shone, and they were afraid to come near him. And this would also be consistent with what we find in Luke seventeen, twenty through twenty one, where it says, Being asked by the Pharisees when the kingdom of God would come, he answered them, The coming of the kingdom is not conspicuous. No one can say, look, here it is, or it's over there, for behold, the kingdom of God is round about you. It is within your reach. Now, heaven is the headquarters of the kingdom of heaven, and according to the Bible, heaven is close at hand, literally close at hand. So close indeed that an occupant of heaven who is in the very presence of God, can stretch out his hand, reach into this realm, and write on the wall with his finger. Now that's a reality that's recorded in the Bible in a variety of events uh, over and over, from cover to cover. And I want to invite you to go and search the scriptures and find passages where voices speak from heaven and where angels appear from heaven. And see if this understanding doesn't make those passages clearer, easier to understand, and more down to earth. Because I've looked at a great many scriptures with this understanding in mind, and in my opinion, it bears up under scrutiny. For lack of better words, heaven 
as it is portrayed in Scripture, occupies the same space that the cosmos occupies, but in a different dimension. Now that may sound like science fiction, but I'd like to remind you that every day science fiction is becoming science fact. And the existence of parallel dimensions is an idea that scientists are well on the way to receiving as science fact. And as I pointed out earlier in Romans 1, Paul assures us that God reveals himself reliably through what has been created. And as such, good scientific inquiry, properly conducted and properly interpreted, ought always to corroborate good biblical inquiry, properly conducted and properly interpreted. And that would certainly seem to be the case here. Through the study of what has been created, scientific inquiry has given us good reason to believe in the existence of multiple dimensions. And the Bible gives us good reason to believe that heaven occupies the same space as the cosmos, but in another dimension. That's certainly the implication of number 789, where it says, Whenever Moses would go into the tent of meeting to speak with the Lord, the voice that spoke to him seemed to be coming from a point just above the mercy seat, atop the ark of the testimony, between the two cherubs. So that's where Moses would direct his words. And we find very much the same in 1 Kings 19, 9-13, where God speaks to Elijah in a still small voice, and 2 Kings 6, 11-17, where at Dothan, Elisha is able to see the realm of heaven plainly, but his servant could not until the Lord opened his eyes. And that brings us back to where we started this morning and the point I want to make with this morning's lesson. When we read about the ascension of Christ, we tend to think of that event in terms of Jesus rising up into the sky, into the stratosphere. And to me... This always brings to mind images of, of, of like this space launches and things where a rocket accelerates to escape velocity and then rolls on its back to find its proper trajectory. And I always just hope Jesus' robes were turned the right direction as he flew off into outer space, wherever that was. Because it never really made any sense to me. Because the scriptures tell us that as Jesus was being respired into heaven... He was hidden from the apostles' sight by clouds, or fog, or a mist, or a haze. But what if it hadn't been? I mean, his journey had to terminate somewhere. Yes, the cloud hid him from their sight, but surely that wasn't just so they wouldn't see where he was going. Surely he didn't hide in that cloud till it drifted away so he could complete his journey to heaven undetected by human eyes. No. When he left, he was gone, and he was gone quickly. But where did he go? Well, if heaven is where I think it is, he vanished into the thin air, just as the hand in Daniel 5 vanished into thin air. The finger from heaven wrote, and having writ, moved on. But heaven didn't move on. It was right there at hand to tell Daniel how to interpret what had been written. So it is with Christ. He has ascended into heaven, but heaven isn't far from us. As Paul tells the Athenians in Acts 17, 26 through 28, from one man he made every nation of men that they should inhabit the whole earth, and he determined the time set for them and the exact places where they should live. God did this so that men would seek him and perhaps reach out for him and find him, yet he is actually not far from each one of us. For in him we live and move and have our being. And it's with this in mind that I would translate Mark 16, 19, Luke 24, 50 through 51, and Acts 1, 9 through 11 as follows. After the Lord Jesus had spoken to them, he led them out as far as Bethany. Then he lifted up his hands and blessed them. While he was blessing them, he left them and was lifted away. 
he was sundered away before their eyes, and a haze hid him from their sight. And he was respired into the thin air, where he took his seat at the right hand of God. They were looking intently at the thin air as he was going, when suddenly two men dressed in white were standing beside them. Man of Galilee, they said, why do you stand here looking into the thin air? This same Jesus who's been taken from you into the thin air will come back the same way you've seen him go, into the thin air. And that brings us to the point that I want to make with today's lesson. And that is the point that I want you to take home with you today. When Christ ascended into heaven, he left the apostles, but he didn't go very far. Because heaven isn't very far away. The Lord Jesus Christ is in heaven, and he is not far from us. He's close at hand, and that is not a sentimental reality. That's an actual reality. That is a spiritual reality and a physical reality. And that's my lesson for today.